I remember one of the first stories I ever read was the story of Charlotte's Web. Remember the story of Charlotte's Web? There's this, this livestock pig named Wilbur who develops a friendship with a spider named Charlotte. For some reason, as a seven or eight year old, I was absolutely fascinated with that story. We love stories. Last weekend, we were down in Guatemala with uh, Justin and Jenny and our granddaughters, and my youngest granddaughter, at least uh, there, o Olivia, over and over again came up and said, Papa, book, Papa, book. And so, man, she made me put her up on my lap and read a story to her. I had to do that over and over again for three or four days. All of us love a story. Many of us are familiar with the stories of the Bible, are we not? The story of Adam and Eve, the story of Noah and the ark, the story of David and Goliath. Man, I, 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 I remember all of those stories as a young child. The story of Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Those are, those are great stories of the Bible. I'm afraid, though, that we have made a serious error. We have fragmented the Bible into bits and pieces. We, we have viewed the Bible as a volume of many different stories. And I'm sure some of us here today even look at the Bible as a collection of a lot of different stories. We view the 66 books of the Bible as if they were 66 different stories that God has just put together, he's kind of edited them and put together in the same book. That's a dangerous way to view Scripture. Because when we view the Bible as just uh, different pieces and different bits and different stories, we lose the great, the grand narrative of the Bible. And here's what I want you to get. I want you to get this. The Bible is not a compilation of many different stories. The Bible's not just an edited version of, of you know, 40 some different storytellers. Rather, the Bible is one story from beginning to end. The Bible is the story of God. Some of us view the Bible as a book of rules. Others of us view the Bible as a book of historical events. Others view the Bible as a book of spiritual recommendations that God has given to us to guide our lives. And all of those things have an element of truth in them. But more than anything else, the Bible is a story. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, it tells one story. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? It tells the story of a, of a child hero who travels from a long distance away to recover his lost treasure. The Bible tells the story of a brave warrior who leaves his palace in order to rescue the one he loves. The Bible tells the story of a suffering servant who gives his life as a sacrifice, as a ransom for the bride whom he loves so very much. You see, the Bible, from beginning to end, is one story. It is the story of God. Over the next four weeks, in just a small, short, simple way, we want to share with you the story of God. What is the Bible all about? And I'm sure we have people here today that, that have, have read the Bible for years, but I'd venture to say that we have many of us here today who look at the Bible and we're confused with the Bible. We pick it up. We don't know where to read. We don't know what the Bible is all about. We don't know what it's trying to tell us. And in four short weeks, we want to tell you the story of the Bible. We want to tell you the story of God. Why did God write this book? What does God desire to communicate with you and with me? We're, looking at, we're going to look at four simple topics. Creation, 
fall, redemption, glory. In other words, today we start with creation. God created us and God created everything we know. And we'll see today that God created us for a specific purpose. God made the world perfect. And then we're going to see not only creation, but we're going to see the fall. Because as God created man, God created humans in perfection. We know the story that Adam and Eve fell into sin and their sin has been uh, passed on to every single one of us. And you and I are just as guilty as Adam and Eve. We are fallen creatures. And God could have said, that's it, man, I'm done. I'm going to get rid of the world that I created, but he didn't. He loves his world. He loves us so much that the third part of the story is redemption, that God sent Jesus, who was the valiant warrior. God sent Jesus, who was the suffering servant. God sent Jesus, who is the redeemer, to rescue, to save, to restore that which was lost. And the last part of the story, theologians call consummation, we're going to call it glory. Because the end of the story is already written. (laughs) The end of your story is already written. God wins the day. And he's glorified as king of kings and lord of lords. So today we start in the beginning of the story. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to the very first page. I guess not the first page after the index and all of that stuff. But the very first page of the Bible Turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I'd encourage you to take some time today and, and, and read through it. It's a fascinating study. We'll make reference to it today, but we won't read it. But notice Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump down and read a few other verses. <clears throat> Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Notice something from the very beginning. We find the different persons of the Trinity there. We find God the Father involved in creation. Here we find God the Holy Spirit who is involved in creation. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that Jesus was involved in creation. We find God creating the world as we know it. Verses 3 through 25, he outlines all of the different things that God created, the light and, and, or night from day, and the sun and the moon and the plants and the animals and all of those things. Jump down with me to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man. He created us in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, as Brad read, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What a a fantastic beginning to God's story. As we look today at the beginning of God's story, Genesis chapter 1 gives us five foundational truths that I kind of want to take just a few moments and flesh out, as I say, or explain so so that we understand these are not only foundational truths for creation, but these are foundational truths for your life and mine. Because quite frankly, we cannot be who God intended for us to be. We cannot accomplish that which God has intended for us to accomplish if we do not understand these foundational truths. 
and they're deep. We're not going to be able to uh, dig into all of them. By the way, on Wednesday night, Brad and I are starting a series in the chapel. We're simply calling it Table Talk, and we would encourage you, because we're going to take today's message, and we're going to dig deeper in today's message on Wednesday night, and we're going to talk through that. And so we're going to do it in a unique format. We'll have coffee and all of that there. We encourage you to come with us as we talk through the truths of the story of God. But the first thing that we see, if you have your outline in front of you, the first thing is this, God created absolutely everything from absolutely nothing. Catch that, God created absolutely everything from absolutely nothing. As we begin looking at the story of God, we see that the Bible starts with God. In the beginning, God. God. God is the ultimate being. Before there was a universe, there was God. Before there was planet Earth, there was God. Before our galaxy, the Milky Way, existed, there was God. God existed in the very beginning. It's interesting, he exists independently of matter, and he exists independently of the sequence of time. You and I live within time that God has created. God lives outside of the barriers of time. For you and I, the past is not the same as the present and the future is not the same as the present. But for God who is eternal, the past is just the same as the present and the future is just as secure as the present. Why is that? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He lives outside of the boundaries of time. He transcends space and time. He's not limited to spatial considerations. He is everywhere at the exact same time. He is here with us today at Hollywood Community Church, and he is at every other church that, that, that he's invited to in South Florida. And he's all over the world. Why? Because he's not limited by spatial consideration. He pre-exists everything that exists. Now, now, now catch this. Every story has a protagonist. In Chicken Little, the main character is Chicken Little, right? In the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the main character is Goldilocks. Every story has a protagonist. Every story has a main character. Please catch this. This is so important. This is a hermeneutical principle that's important for your understanding of the gospel. The main character of the Bible is God. Now, you might sit back and say, duh, Brian, I think we knew that. But from a practical point of view, we interpret the Bible as if we were the main characters. We interpret the Bible as if we were the heroes. We interpret the Bible as if the Bible was all about us. God is the main character of the Bible. The Bible is not about you. The Bible applies to you. The Bible applies to me, but it is not about us. The story of God is about much more than us. You see, the story of God is this eternal God created. Everything that exists originates from God. Here in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible employs a special Hebrew word for the act of creation. It's the Hebrew word bara. The the subject of that verb, it's used throughout Scripture, but the subject of that verb is always God. That verb is never used in reference to any other subject. It is only used in reference to God. In the beginning, God created. Verse 2 tells us how. Verse 2 says that the earth was without form and void. Here's the point that that, uh, God is conveying in those first few verses. The point being that God created everything that we know from absolutely nothing. The Latin phrase, you maybe have heard the Latin phrase, the Latin phrase is ex nihilo. It means from nothing. 
God created everything that we know, the beauty of South Florida. He created it from nothing. It's not like he went to, you know, Toys R Us and bought a kit and then created the universe out of this kit that already existed. He created absolutely everything from absolutely nothing. No, I know that there are scientists who deny the reality of a creator God. Many have tried to disprove the creation accounts. Some have denied the authenticity of miracles throughout Scripture. Stephen Hawking and others have promoted a thought that's called scientific determinism. They state that miracles are contrary to the laws of nature, and so natural laws cannot be violated, they insist, so miracles cannot exist. The simple truth is that science, catch this, this is so important, science does not disprove God. No matter what you've heard, science does not disprove God. As a matter of fact, God proves science. Some of the most recent scientific discoveries don't point away from God, but some of the most recent scientific discoveries point towards the existence of God. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Some of the most recent scientific discoveries are this, the universe had a beginning. For years, we were told that that the universe didn't have a beginning. This matter just always existed. And now, all of a sudden, physicists and others have come to the conclusion, Stephen Hawking himself, before he died, that no, we can trace it back. And there was a beginning of the universe. Now, they haven't attributed to God. They say there was a beginning. We don't know when it was. We don't know how it was, but we believe there was a beginning. Well, we know how it was. It was here in Genesis chapter 1. We've known all along that the universe had a beginning. Scientists are now talking about the fact that we live in a fine-tuned universe. Here's what that means. That means that the conditions of the world in which we live, the conditions necessary to sustain life are so complex, so incredibly complex. One prominent physicist, a British physicist, who by the way was not a believer, stated that the odds of the conditions that exist in the world today, the odds of that happening randomly are equal or comparable to a tornado going through a junkyard and at the end of the tornado there sits a Boeing 747 jet. The odds are absolutely incalculable that randomly the world would be created to such a degree that you and I are able to live on this planet and sustain life. Scientists are baffled by it. How could that happen? We know how it could happen. God created the heavens and the earth. The regularity of our universe. How many of you woke up really early this morning before the sun came up and you were so worried whether the sun was gonna come up or not? (laughs) And last night you went to bed thinking, oh my word, man, I hope the sun sets today. What would happen if the sun doesn't? No, we don't worry about that. We don't worry about the sun rising. We don't worry about the sun setting. Tomorrow, guess what's gonna happen? The sun's gonna come up and then the sun's gonna come down. And the day after tomorrow, it's gonna come up and it's gonna come down. And it's going on for months and years and generations and centuries. Scientists are baffled by the regularity of the universe. Why is that? We have a God, an intelligent God, an all-powerful God who created the world that we know. He created everything we know from absolutely nothing. I would say this, please catch this, science is not the enemy of the Bible. Science is not the enemy of the Bible. By the way, we thank God for scientists. We thank God for physicists. We thank God for medical doctors. Because of science, our life is so much better. The medical advances in our world have been absolutely incredible. I'm alive today, obviously because of the power of God, but I'm alive today because of the advances of science and scientists who have invented medicines and stents that they could put in and procedures that they can make a blocked artery opened up. Thank God for science. And thank God for scientists. The Bible is not against science. It corroborates it. The simple truth is this, though, church. Miracles are supernatural. You cannot study the supernatural with natural laws. 
So, so the purpose of Genesis 1, because sometimes we sit back and scientists are critical saying, you know what, man, it, it, they're just the detail isn't there. We can't just accept that by faith. The reason that Genesis chapter 1 was written was not to prove the scientific probability of creation. Genesis chapter 1 is not a scientific treatise. It is a theological treatise. You see, remember, these words were written after Moses came down from Mount Sinai. If you remember, uh, I mean, we like to think that this was written in the very beginning. It wasn't. The children of Israel began and existed without a written word of God. And, and then uh, as the children of Israel traveled from Egypt to the promised land, Moses climbed Mount Sinai, you remember, and he received the very first written words of God, which were the Ten Commandments. And so he then came down from the mount, and God instructed him to write and so he wrote what is known by us today as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But he wrote that for a reason, because the children of Israel were about to enter into the promised land, a land whose inhabitants worshipped the sun and worshipped the moon. And God wanted the Israelites to know that there was a God, an all-powerful God, who created the sun and the moon. And he did not want his people to be corrupted by the paganism and the idolatry of the land of Palestine. The purpose of Genesis is not to prove how God scientifically created the world. The purpose of Genesis is to prove that there is no other God but Jehovah God. That's why it was written. He is the God of the Bible. He, he is the God of the Israelites. He is the God who is merciful. He is the God who desires to redeem his fallen creation. And he is the God who desires to have a personal relationship with you and me. How cool is it that the creator of the universe wants to know you and wants to know me? So the first truth that we see is this. God created absolutely everything from absolutely nothing. Notice the second thing that we see in chapter one. We see that God created the world with a purpose. The world in which we live was created with a purpose. Now, now that purpose was not to sustain life, even though it sustains life. That, that purpose was, was not to provide a beautiful home for humans where we could live and enjoy life, even though he's given us a beautiful home where we can live and enjoy life life. The world and everything we know it was created to bring honor and glory to God. Catch that, it's pivotal. It is so foundational to your relationship with God. Everything that God created was created for the purpose of bringing Him honor and glory. Let me show you just two verses, and I can give you 10 more if you're interested. But here are two verses, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 1. The psalmist says, the heavens declare what? The glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. God says this, man, every time you go out and there's a clear sky and you look up and the sky is just filled with these beautiful stars and planets, those planets are all crying out, they're all singing, glory to God in the highest. They were created for the purpose of bringing him glory. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. God created the world. He created everything that we know. He created us so that he would receive the honor and the glory. There is nothing that exists for itself. God created everything for his glory, and everything is created to reflect his glory. Think with me as the sun, and how beautiful is it to be at the beach and to see that sun begin to rise. And we see that sun begin to rise from the beach. Every single day as that sun rises, it reflects the glory of God. Every flower that blossoms, every flower that blooms in all of its beauty, every flower reflects the glory of God. 
as nature shows off its beauty, it reflects God's glory. So, so here's something I want you to catch and kind of personalize today. The question is not, does nature reflect God's glory? Because the answer is yes, it does. Every single day, it reflects God's glory. The question is this, do you reflect God's glory? Do I reflect God's glory? Because just as the sun was created to reflect the glory of God and nature was created to reflect the glory of God and beauty was created to reflect the glory of God, you were created for a purpose. That purpose was not to make as much money as you possibly can. That purpose was not to achieve all of your dreams. That purpose was not whatever it is, and none of those things are bad in and of themselves, but that is not why you were created. You were created for the purpose of bringing glory to God. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I would submit to you today that the world is filled with tragedy. The world is filled with sadness. The world is filled with heartache. But I would submit to you that one of the most tragic things of life is for someone to live their entire life and misunderstand his or her purpose. And to misunderstand that they were created to bring glory to God. Doesn't matter what they've accomplished, doesn't matter what they've made, doesn't matter how famous they are, they don't fulfill their purpose if they're not bringing glory to God. Genesis 1 shows us that God created the world with a purpose. Let me show you the third thing. God created the world and it was good. God created the world and it was good. Genesis 1, 31, the, the last verse of the first chapter after, after he cre- uh, f- finishes the whole creation account, I love this. It says this, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. I love how the Message Bible says it. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. Think with me of the goodness of God's creation. I've already mentioned that the beauty of the beaches of South Florida. Can you imagine God creating the beaches and looking down and saying, ah, no, that's good. (laughs) That's good. The deliciousness of your favorite foods. Can you imagine God making the things that he's made and looking down and saying, ah, no, that's good. Hey, hey, have you ever had a good piece of meat? You ever had just a great steak and you cut into it and you come in and it's just cooked just the way you like it and you cut into it and you, you put that bite in your mouth and you sit back and think, ah, oh, now that's good. That's good. You ever had a cup of coffee in the morning and you took a sip of that coffee and you thought, oh man, is that good? Is that good? Think, man, God not only created the coffee, God created different soils that produce coffee with different tastes. He produced the soils of Guatemala that produces coffee that tastes one way, and he produced the soil of Ecuador that produces coffee a different way. Why is that? Because God's good, and whatever God creates is good. You ever had a bowl of ice cream that just melted in your mouth? And you sat back and thought, oh man, that's good. That's exactly what Genesis 131 is talking about. God saw everything that he created, and God sat back, not in an egotistical way, but God sat back and said, now that's good. That is good. Listen, let me, let me share this with you today. It's so important. Unless you are violating the law, Unless you are hurting another person, damaging your body, or sinning, you can fully enjoy everything that God has created. God has created a world that is good for us in his grace and his mercy. He's given us a beautiful planet in which we can live. And we say that in its fallen condition. Just wait till the earth will be restored. When Jesus comes back, And the earth is restored to what God fully intended it for it to be. Let me give you a fourth truth. 
The fourth truth is this, God made man and woman and his image and in his likeness. Verse 26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Last Sunday, some of you were probably confused as a a skinnier version of Brian walked up on the platform. (laughs) We kind of did that intentionally. We didn't tell you that I was going to be gone, and we didn't tell you Bruce was going to be here. And so 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 many people thought, oh, my word, Brian's lost all kinds of weight. (laughs) I I always joke with Bruce and tell him he's the sickly version of Brian, right? (laughs) I look healthy, and he looks sickly. (laughs) Yeah, if you didn't catch it, we're identical twins. I do always remind him that I am the firstborn, and so I don't look like him, he looks like me, all right? (laughs) Last Sunday, we were down at Iglesia Reforma, Justin, our son's church in Guatemala City, and as we were walking in, Justin didn't introduce me, nobody said anything, but I don't know how many times somebody stopped and looked at me and said, tu eres el papá de Justin. You're Justin's dad, aren't you? That happened. They asked me that over and over and over again. Why is that? He, he was made to a certain degree in my image. He, he looks like me. He acts like me. If you saw Bruce, I mean, our voices. I don't know how many people said, okay, skinnier than you, but if I close my eyes, Brian, I thought it was you talking. And his gestures are the exact same. Why? We're made in, in a very similar image. Catch this, church. Catch this. You were made in the image and the likeness of God. You were made, male and female, you were made in the image of God. That fact distinguishes you from the rest of creation. That fact distinguishes you from the animal kingdom. That fact distinguishes you from the plants. That fact distinguishes you from anything else. For centuries, theologians have debated, what does that mean? Some have said, well, it's about man's makeup. It's his ontological qualities. Man cre- God created man with the ability to reason, to think, to make decisions. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. That's what John Calvin and Augustine held to. Others said, no, no, no. To be made in God's image means that we can have a relationship. Only man can have a relationship with God. The animal kingdom can't have the relationship with God than we could have. That's what Karl Barth and Bruner and others suggested. Some have said, no, 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 it's about man's authority. This is often referred to as functional vice regency. Man functions as God's chief representative. Man alone exercises dominion over the rest of God's creation. You say, Brian, which one of those are right? All of them are right. All three of them are true. God has given us authority. God's given us reason. We have the ability to relate with God. He has placed us as authorities over the earth. The tragic reality, though, is that because of sin, we no longer perfectly reflect the image of God. The relationship with our creator is broken, and redemptive history bears witness to man's inability to obey and honor God. And God could have said, whenever Adam and Eve fell, God could have said, man, you've ruined my purpose. I created you to to reflect my image, to be my image bearers, is what the text actually means. I, I, I created you for this purpose. Now you've blown it. Now I'm just going to destroy you. But the glorious truth of the story of God is that restoration is possible through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is the perfect image bearer of God. Read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Jesus, who is the very image of God, was sent to earth, became like one of us, lived a sinful life, died on the cross for us, and his redeeming work restores to us the image of God to repentant sinners and establishes us as heirs of God and co-heirs of Jesus Christ. And it is only through Jesus, because of Jesus, that you and I are able to fulfill that purpose. And church, think, you were created to look, to act, to think 
like God. That's why you were created. The more we become like him, the more we reflect his glory. I remember as a little child singing a song, simple little chorus, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, my desire to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory, my desire to be like him. What's your desire? By the way, ask Stephen, or ask Evan, I led worship in the Saturday morning service yesterday. All right, our team couldn't show up, and so they put me in as the fill-in. It's actually on video, so I'm not sure anybody will come back next week, but I ended up doing that. Listen, here's what I want you to catch. You were created to be like Jesus. Why do we miss that? Why do we get off track? Why do we get sidelined? Why do other things become so important to us? God created me. God created you for the purpose of being his image bearer here in the world. What would happen in the city of Hollywood if all 400 of us left here today and we said by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to reflect the image of God in my home, in my neighborhood, in my work. I want to be like Jesus. That's why you were created. That's why I was created. There's a fifth thing. Let me mention it quickly and I'm done. God created man with a distinct purpose. Verse 28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The simple truth is this. The divine task that has been given to us is a, is a task of stewardship. It's a task of responsibility. Theologians call it the cultural mandate, and we're going to talk about that later in the year. It refers to the stewardship of God's creation. We have been made stewards. We have been given dominion over everything that God has created. There's two phrases. Uh, indulge me for just a second. The first phrase is be fruitful and multiply, which means to develop the social world in which we live. We're to build families. We're to build churches. We're to build schools. We're to build cities. We're to build governments. We are to better the society in which we live. Sometimes as, as evangelicals, we've whittled it down to, you got to tell everybody you know about Jesus, and if you're not doing that, you're not fulfilling what God wants you to do. Listen, church, it's so much more than that. God has placed you where he's placed you to better the world in which you live. He's placed you in your neighborhood so that you can make your neighborhood a better place. He has placed you in your, in your work so that you can make the world a better place. If you're an engineer, be an engineer to the glory of God and make the world in which we live a better place. If you're a teacher, be a teacher to the glory of God and teach those students and, and better those students. If you're a businessman and you work at a bank, do it to enhance the world in which we live. That's why God created us. He created us for us to reflect his kingdom in the world in which we live. What if we all understood that homework? What if we all left here saying, man, I am God's vice regent. I am God's representative in this next week. In my place of work, I'm gonna do the very best that I can and I'm gonna make the world a better place because that's what God has instructed me to do. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and make the world a better place. But he says a, a second thing. There's a second phrase. The second phrase, he says, subdue the earth. That means to harness the natural world, to plant crops, to build bridges, to design computers, to compose music, to use your gifts and talents and abilities to make the world a better place. This mandate is still in force today. As vice regents of God, we're to bring God's truth and God's will to bear on every sphere of our world and our society. Richard Pratt says this, 
He says, by filling and ruling over the world, we fulfill our true purpose in life. We reach the heights of dignity because we represent and extend the authority of the king of the universe to the world in which we live. Here's what that means. We are to take care of God's creation. We are to use the talents that he's, and abilities he's given us to better our world. We are to enlarge his kingdom, and we are to fill the earth with image bearers of God, people who reflect the image of God, the story of God. The story of God is not about us. If you drew a circle and said, okay, here's the story of God, who's in the middle? It's not you. Take yourself out of the middle of the story. It's not about you. It's about God. And if we could lay aside our egotism, and if we could lay aside our selfishness, and we could lay aside all of that and understand why we have been created, we'd come to the realization that we're not the hero. We're the one who needs to be rescued. We're the ones who need a savior who will deliver us from Satan, from sin, and from death. It's only when we bow down to the real hero of the story that we place ourselves where God wants us to be in the story of God. Would you pray with me today? Thank you that you're a sovereign, loving, compassionate, caring, all-powerful, omniscient God who's created a world in which we could live. God, help us to not write our own stories. Help us to realize that the story has already been written. Help us not to make ourselves the protagonists of the story, the main character, but may you be the main character of our lives. In Brian's life, may Jesus be lifted up. In the life of our church, may Jesus be lifted up. Help us to be like Jesus. If you're here today and you've never by faith reached out to Jesus Christ and allowed him to rescue you, the message of the gospel is for you today. And you can do that simply by faith, repenting of your inability to please God and reaching out to Jesus, who is the only person who can do that. We have counselors down front who would love to point you in that direction. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer and you say, man, Brian, I've made my life all about me and I'm frustrated and my life isn't becoming what I want it to be. And maybe today you just want to pause and pray wherever you are and say, okay, God, it's not about me. It's about you. Help me to make you the center point of my life. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Help us to be sensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.